It's good to see you guys and uh, hope you are filled with gladness and joy that we get to come together and worship God. So would you do this? Would you turn to someone next to you and just say, it is good to see you today. I know some of you guys are like, that's kind of, I don't really like those moments of, of these services, but um, it really is just a reminder that, you know, we see you, we love you, and you know, sometimes we just need to be reminded of that. You know, life gets difficult, um, things get hard, and we just need someone to say, hey, I, I care about you, I'm, I'm here for you. But with all that said, I'm going to pray, and then I would love to just dive into God's word with the rest of you. So let's pray. God, we just want to thank you. We just want to praise you. We just want to lift up the name of Jesus in this place. And so, God, would you stir up our hearts to be filled with affection again for you? And, Lord, would your Holy Spirit move in this time and in this place? I ask that you would really speak through me. God, a word that is timely, a word that is needed for today. God, we just thank you that your Holy Spirit is with us, and we look forward to all that is in store. We love you, Lord, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I want to start off our time with a question, and I don't mean to bring up bad memories, but I'm genuinely curious, did anyone grow up going to SAT tutoring? Anybody? You just raise your hand. I'm genuinely curious, okay? Okay, I see, okay, I see you. Yep, yep. Um, I think my mom had me start SAT tutoring in, it was either late elementary school <laughs> or early junior high. I kid you not. Um, I don't know if you've grown up with a tiger parent, that's my mother. <laughs> um, and so I grew up going to SAT tutoring. And maybe you guys, many of you guys did as well. And if you took English classes or verbal classes, then you know that something that they had you do in that class is you learn to break apart words so you could better understand what those words mean. Right, meaning you take apart the suffix, the base word, the prefix, and through that you have a better understanding of what a certain word means because they put some pretty big words on the SAT, amen? <laughs> but I want to talk about this word supernatural because that's the title of our two-part series that starts this week and continues on into next week. And so first, can we all say Supernatural. So that word can be broken up into two distinct words, the first being super, the second being natural. Pop quiz, what does super mean? Do you guys remember that prefix? Many of you guys probably memorized it. It means above or beyond. Someone went to SAT tutoring, clearly, right? Above or beyond, and then natural, it means that which falls into the laws of nature. So when we put that together, when we talk about supernatural, what we're saying is this is beyond what is natural. And that's a perfect description of what the Holy Spirit does, the work of the Holy Spirit. And so who is the Holy Spirit? Well, oftentimes our experiences shape our perspectives. And so if you've grown up maybe unchurched, maybe you're new to this whole church scene, then maybe your understanding of the Holy Spirit has been shaped by media depictions of who the Holy Spirit is. If you grew up in a charismatic context, then maybe you came to understand the Holy Spirit through expressions of gifts. If you grew up in the Reformed camp, then maybe your understanding of the Holy Spirit came through understand the conviction that would, you'd experience in your heart whenever you came across the word of God, right? But our experiences with the Holy Spirit shape our perspective of who he is. And so again, who is this Holy Spirit? 
If you guys were here during Easter, we actually baptized eight very special, very beloved individuals, and we baptized them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so why do we do that? Why is it that we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Well, it's because we are obeying the command of Jesus that he gives in Matthew 28, where he says this. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. See, in that verse, we see something called the Trinity. And this is a fundamental doctrine of the Protestant Christian church. I mean, it's so important that I actually needed to write up a statement of doctrine regarding the Trinity when I was ordained. And this is how I started it off. I wrote, the Trinity is the Godhead three in one. God is one substance with three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have eternally existed in perfect union with different roles. See, the Trinity helps explain the unity of God as well as the distinction of roles between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Trinity influences our worship and our prayer to God. It influences our relationships within the church And the Trinity even gives us an intellectual framework for the gospel. So the Trinity matters, and the third person of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. I want to talk a little bit more about the the, um, ways that the Holy Spirit is described in Scripture. And one of the ways that he's depicted is as wind, as wind. In John chapter 3, verse 8, Jesus himself makes this comparison, and he says this, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. And in the same way that wind influences our environments, but we don't see it, that's how it is with the Holy Spirit. He is constantly working and moving, even if we do not see him. But there's also a passage where it talks about the power of the Holy Spirit as it compares the Holy Spirit to win. This is what it says in Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. So if you just imagine what's happening in this passage where early believers in the church are waiting and they're praying, waiting for the Holy Spirit to come and anticipating his arrival. And as the Holy Spirit comes, there is this sound like a mighty rushing wind that fills the entire room. Right? It's a scene of power, and you see that the Holy Spirit fills these individuals with power. That though once they were fearful and timid, all of a sudden they have courage and boldness to go out and to proclaim the gospel message, even in the face of danger and even to the point of death. But there's another image of the Holy Spirit in Scripture and that's fire. Not only is the Holy Spirit depicted as wind, but also as fire. And we see this in Acts chapter 2. It says, And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Again, if you imagine just placing yourself in that room where they're waiting and praying, anticipating the arrival of the Holy Spirit. And that room is filled with this mighty rushing wind sound. But all of a sudden, as these believers open up their eyes, 
they see these tongues of fire as if other people in that room were caught on fire, but they were not burning up. See, there's this powerful image, this powerful experience that these believers had. And so the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He's depicted as wind and as fire. But what does he do? What does the Holy Spirit do? I found this list from Lifeway Publishing Company. And if you want, you can go ahead and take some time too and even just spend time looking through all of these verses. I encourage you to do so, to really understand what the Holy Spirit does in your life and in our world. But this is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He counsels, he imparts wisdom, he calls to ministry, he empowers, he illuminates, he produces fruit, he seals, he strengthens, he helps, he intercedes, he provides truth, he teaches, he testifies, he guides, he also grieves, and he convicts, and he loves, and he adopts. See, these are the things that the Holy Spirit does, and if we see him as a lesser member of the Trinity, then we've lost sight of how important the Holy Spirit really is in our lives and in our world. But it's this last ministry that I want to focus on today that the Holy Spirit adopts. Would you look at somebody next to you and say, the Holy Spirit adopts? I want to talk about two things, specifically what he adopts us from, and next, what he adopts us to. So who does the Holy Spirit adopt us from? Or rather, what does the Holy Spirit adopt us from, and what does he adopt us to? So let's start with the first. We have been adopted from slavery. We've been adopted from slavery. Look at somebody and say, we've been adopted from slavery. See, there's this claim that the Bible makes, and it says that we were all once slaves. Every single one of us was a slave at some point. It says this in Romans 6, verse 16, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? Beforehand, in that same book, Romans talks about how all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. When you put that together, you start to realize that as we have sinned and as we have given ourselves to sin, we actually have become enslaved to sin as well. How does sin enslave us, though? Because that's such a strong image, right, that we are in chains enslaved to sin. How does sin enslave us. I believe there are five ways that sin enslaves us. And here's the first. Sin enslaves us by distorting our view of God, of who he is, of the loving, gentle, gracious father that he is. Sin distorts our understanding of him. I'm not a parent yet. I hope to be one day. But the closest thing that I've experienced to parenting is being an uncle. And I love my uncle experience because I can just spend time with my niece. And when I'm tired or when I don't want to be with her anymore, <laughs> I can just leave. <laughs> but it's really funny because my niece, I love her to death. And, and I remember... Um, this one specific moment, it wasn't too long ago, and at that point in life, she just really developed an affinity for something called sugar. And I remember um, we ate at a restaurant in the San Gabriel Valley. We finished up eating, and then we go to one of my favorite boba spots called Wushi Lands. Can I get a hallelujah from anybody? Well, we went to Wushi Lands. And Lizzie's there. And Lizzie just has too much, I mean, she has too much sugar to begin with. So all the adults 
has settled on the fact that she should not have any more sugar. She shouldn't get tea in her system. She shouldn't get that caffeine. She shouldn't have more sugar. And it was such an interesting moment because I think Lizzie thought that she was going to get some boba. But we go to the boba shop, and we all get our boba, and she finds out there's no boba for her. And she asks for boba, and we all say, Lizzie, you can't have boba today. And in that moment, her look changed from what was first a look of excitement and anticipation to a mixture of shock and fear and rage. And it was just all mixed up in her tiny little face. And all of a sudden, she just cries out, I want boba. And her face just changed. I had never seen her face like that. And her little face was just such a mixture of emotion like I had never seen before. And in her little mind, she's probably thinking, these adults, they hate me. They want me to have a miserable life. And we're just thinking, we don't want you to get diabetes. <laughs> but Lizzie can't understand that. At least she couldn't at that time. And oftentimes, our experience of God is like that where sin can cause us to think God just doesn't want us to enjoy life, when God actually wants us to refrain from certain things that are harmful to us so that we can enjoy life fully. And so if you are ever struggling with sin, just think about my little niece, Lizzie. Amen? <laughs> so that's number one. Sin enslaves us by distorting our view of God. Number two, sin enslaves us by filling us with guilt and shame. There's something that happens after we fall into sin. Oftentimes, after we engage in sin, guilt begins to come up. We experience the sense of guilt, of remorse. And from there, oftentimes, then we experience shame. I, I can't go to God. I can't be around other people because there's shame. And oftentimes what happens is a cycle begins to form where we might sin. And because of that, we experience guilt. And from there, we experience shame that causes us to isolate ourselves from other people. And then that gets repeated. Sin leads to guilt, leads to shame, which leads to more sin and guilt and shame. And before we know it, we are enslaved because of sin. Next, sin enslaves us by numbing us to the things of God. See, sometimes after we sin, we feel guilt and shame. But sometimes something else happens. We, we start to feel indifference and numbness to the sin that we once felt guilt and shame over. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced that, where, where maybe you, you wanted to avoid sin in your life. And maybe at first, you, you kept yourself far from it. And you thought, I'm not going to get close to that sin. But then over time, you thought, well, maybe I don't have to be that extreme. Maybe I can just... Come over here. And then the next thought comes up, well, maybe I don't, maybe I can actually, I'm strong enough to avoid this, this temptation. And so maybe I can get a little bit closer. And before you know it, you've actually not just entertained the thought of sin, but engaged in it. And maybe when that first happens, there's this sense of shock and this sense of guilt. And you go, I can't believe this happened. But sometimes what happens is that we have this thought, well, if I already did it once, what does it matter if I engage in this sin a second time? And 
since I've done it twice, what does it matter if I engage in this sin a third time? And before we know it, where we once felt conviction and remorse, all of a sudden there's just indifference and numbness. See, sin can enslave us in that way. Next, sin can enslave us by fueling addiction. And oftentimes, as sin feeds us, as we engage in sin, we can all of a sudden become dependent on certain habits. And so while once we might have had control over our circumstances, all of a sudden, our habits begin to control us. See, sin can do that. And lastly, sin enslaves us by diminishing the joy of freedom. See, in the same way that the Israelites in the Old Testament of Scripture, they lost that sense of joy, of being freed from Egypt, the land of slavery. We can sometimes lose that kind of joy of being set free from our sin. We can lose that that sense of gladness of no longer being in sin. And we lose sight of freedom. That that freedom that comes from a second chance and that freedom that comes from being set free from, from the addictions in our lives, we can forget that. And the joy of being in freedom can be diminished because of sin. So in those ways, sin, it enslaves us. It really does. And I want to drive that point home because in order to understand the gospel fully, I love what Pastor Tim Keller says, you have to hear the bad news in order to understand how good the good news really is. See, this is what sin does. And all of us, were enslaved to sin. That's just what it did to us. And so what's the good news? It's that Jesus came so that we could be set free. So even though once we might have been stuck in sin, even though once we might have been in bondage and in darkness and hopeless, that Jesus came, took our sins upon himself so that we could be set free. See, that is the truth of the gospel message, and that's why it is called the good news. Can I get an amen? It's the truth that Jesus came to set us free. A lot of times we talk about forgiveness, and forgiveness is extended because of what Jesus has done, but there's also freedom. And sometimes we lose sight of the freedom that God offers to us because of what Jesus has done. And so we're going to pivot right now. We're going to go into this next section of the message, which is the good news, that we have been adopted into sonship. So look at someone next to you and say, we've been adopted into sonship. There wasn't enough conviction in that. So one more time, look at somebody next to you and say, we've been adopted into sonship. So we've been adopted into sonship. It's just that don't, that don't cut it. I'm sorry. See, when you understand this message that we were stuck in sin, Romans talks about that. We were dead in our sins. And every single one of us had fallen short. Yet, what happened? Jesus Christ came so that we could have eternal life. And later on, Romans 8 starts talking about the opportunity of life that we have in the Holy Spirit and the kind of lives that we get to enjoy as we are adopted and become sons and daughters of our Creator. It does not get better than that. I want to read this passage to you guys from Romans 8, and we're going to camp on this passage for the rest of our time together. This passage describes what happens as we are adopted and become sons and daughters of God. Here's what it says. So then, brothers, meaning we step into the family of God, 
We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. What Paul is saying is, you've been set free by Jesus. So now if there is an obligation, it's not an obligation to live in the way that you once did when you were still in slavery. But now you are obligated to live a life that is set apart, a life that is led by the Holy Spirit. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. He's talking about a specific kind of death. Now, remember that Paul is talking to believers. And once you're a believer, once you have that relationship with God, that real, vibrant relationship with him, that can never be taken away from you. And so he's not talking about a death that refers to hell, even though the Bible does talk about that. But what he's saying to the church is, if you live according to your flesh, your body's desires as it's tainted by sin, then you're going to experience a separation from God. That sin will cause you to get farther and farther from the intimacy that you desire with God. And for someone who's a follower of Jesus, for someone who's a lover of Jesus, that's one of the biggest fears And probably would be one of the biggest regrets if you experience that in your life, to not experience God, to not behold him fully, to not have that deep intimacy with him. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And just a quick note on that verse, what this is saying is, by the Spirit you put to death. If you're struggling with sin and you want to overcome sin in your life, how do you do that? This passage actually talks about it. It says, if by the Spirit you put to death, meaning you lean on the Holy Spirit, but you also take certain measures. You lean on the Holy Spirit, but you also take certain measures in your own life. And step by step, leaning on the Holy Spirit, you can begin to overcome sin in your life. Verse 14, for all who are led by the Spirit are sons of God. That means if you're a child of God, now your life belongs to God. And now you are led. You're called to be led by the Holy Spirit. That verb, to be led, it's this passive verb. It means you willingly allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. I don't know what your experience is like with allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you, especially when you are still in the flesh, but many times it's not easy. I remember this one story so clearly but it was such, because it was such a clear example of my flesh and my reluctance to be led by the Spirit, but then also what happened as I said yes to allowing the Holy Spirit to lead me. Um, I don't know if you guys knew this about my past, but there was a year in my life where I was a seventh grade life science teacher in Pacoima. So I taught seventh graders, and that was the hardest year of my life, hands down. Hands down, hardest year of my life. And in that season, because of that, because of other situations where I just experienced a lot of heartbreak, it was just such a painful moment. And in that pain, God used that for something good. He used it to teach me that It's not just nice to have God in my life, but I literally need him to just keep my sanity. So in that season, I would spend an hour in the morning just in the word with God. I would spend my day just praying to God. And 
And any spare moment I had to pray, I just took it because I just needed it. And then at night, I just needed at least an hour of uninterrupted prayer. It wasn't because I was so holy. It was because I was so broken. But as I was teaching, oftentimes my commutes were pretty long. And so I would, I remember this one day when I was driving back from Bacoima to West Hills in the San Fernando Valley where I lived. And I had praise music on and I was praying. I was talking to God. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I just experienced this this strong conviction of the Holy Spirit to call up a brother from the church I was serving in. It's not this, but a former church. And to ask him if he's free to hang out. I wanted to pretend I didn't experience that conviction and I didn't hear that prompting of the Holy Spirit, but it was just so strong. So I called him. And I don't know if you guys have ever made calls where you really hope and pray that the person you're calling doesn't pick up. That was one of those moments for me. So it rings once, he hasn't picked up. Right, so I'm kind of getting a little more excited. As it rings twice, still hasn't picked up. I'm like, God, maybe you're wrong about this, uh, <laughs> hanging out with this one brother. Three times, doesn't pick up. And then all of a sudden, hello. <laughs> and in my flesh, <sighs> my heart just dropped. I was like... Hey, bro, hey, hey, how's it going? Uh, how's your day been? So I asked him, hey, how's, how's everything been today? And he started sharing, he goes, yeah, I mean, it's been okay, but I was sick today. And all of a sudden, I just kind of experienced this surge of excitement, like, okay, yeah, so um, tell me more about that. So like, are you, are you pretty sick? You probably can't hang out today then, huh? And he just goes, no, no, I'm good. I'm going to hang out. If you want to just come, let's meet up right now. I was like, great, let's, let's meet up right now. So I turn my car around. I drive to his house. I pick him up. And we spend the day together. Eat food at one of my favorite restaurants at the time, Yoshinoya. <laughs> we go over to the church. We spend time in prayer together. I drop him back off home, and then I, I go home. And I was reflecting on that day, that whole experience of just the Holy Spirit speaking to me to love on this brother, my reluctance to do so, but then the blessing that I had a chance to experience as I said yes to the Holy Spirit's promptings. And that was one of the clearest moments in my life where I felt like I was a person, a, a, a third member, just looking in to God's love for one of his children. Because clearly I didn't want to be in that, in, in that situation. I didn't want to spend time with this brother. But I just saw God's love for this brother. How he wanted to send someone to him so he could experience love. Send someone to him so that he could experience God's tangible heart for him. Seeing being led by the Holy Spirit is kind of like that. Where a lot of times in our flesh, we don't want to go. But when we say yes, we are the ones who get to experience the blessings of God. And so if you signed up to be a follower of Jesus, that means that your life is now filled with the excitement and the adventure of having someone else tell you how to live. And it's not always easy, but it's always a life that is filled with goodness, and with adventure. I 
I want to start wrapping up our time together and get to this next verse. It says, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. What this passage is saying is you don't have to have the mindset of a slave because you are no longer there. You've been set free as you have been called a child of God. You've been set free by the Holy Spirit, adopted by him. And now instead, you can go to God, not with the posture of fear, seeing him as an impersonal God who's just angry and wrathful towards you, but instead, you can approach him with confidence, knowing that he is a gentle, a gracious, and a loving father to you. I was thinking about this concept of adoption. And I spent some time just thinking about the experience of an orphan. Someone whose parents aren't in their lives anymore, either because they've passed or they're just separated from them. And I just kind of... I thought about that kind of pain and struggle that an orphan might go through, especially with that separation from their parents. And then especially if that happens because of negligence or because of abuse, because their parents were not loving parents to their children. And as I was thinking about this and looking things up online, I came across this story that captured the joy of a boy who was adopted into a new family. Well, there's a story that came out in December of 2018 around Christmas time. A little boy named Carter Wiles, nephew of the Kiffert family, Kiffert parents, he was staying with his relatives because he had been in an undesirable living situation. And he's staying with his aunt, his uncle, the rest of his family members. And when Christmas came around, his adoption status was nearing a deadline where if his uncle and aunt did not adopt him, he would be given to someone outside the home. And so there's a video that captured his adoption proposal where the family invites him to become a part of their family. And I want you guys to check this video out. Love you, buddy. 
Now you can stay here forever. Yeah. Until you're 18, then I'm kicking your butt out. <laughs> but you have to sleep in the hot tub room. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. You want to you store a dog, Chip? That's a yes. Yay! Holy time! Yeah. Love you, Parker. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Parker. It's a, it's a powerful video, and it depicts what God has done for us. You know, once we were lost, once we were in darkness and enslaved to sin, and God said, I'm not going to let this child of mine stay there. I want them to be adopted as my son and my daughter. And so Jesus went to that cross, provided us an opportunity to have a relationship with God. And as we say yes to that relationship, we receive the spirit of adoption. And now we can cry out, Abba, Father, to our God. I just, I love Carter's reaction when he's in tears and he just says, thank you. And I remember when I first became aware of, of the gospel, where God first opened my eyes to the truth and the beauty of the gospel message, I couldn't stop praying those words. Thank you. Thank you, God. Because I knew how undeserving I was. I knew how much I did not deserve that opportunity to come to God but in grace, he extended that to me. And he's extended that to us. And if you haven't yet made Jesus your Savior and your Lord, maybe today's the day to make that decision. And if you have, maybe today's a reminder of what God has done for you in your life, the grace that he's shown you, that that would cause you to experience awe and wonder of what God has done in your life and also that you would be reminded that there are other people around you who have not yet heard this message and they need to know because this message is too good not to know. New Story Church is a missional church and we're gonna be a missional church until the day that God takes us up to be with him. We believe in missions locally. We believe in missions globally. Also that more people could experience what adoption into God's family is like. And so I want to invite up the praise team as well as the short-term mission team to Thailand. You guys can come on up. If you guys haven't heard yet, yeah, you can give it up for them. If you have not heard yet, this time of the year is actually a, a pretty full season for us. We have a mission team currently in Indonesia. We have a team coming up, this team going to Thailand real soon. We have another team, a youth team going to Costa Rica. And then we have another team that we're sending to Indonesia. So we have a lot of short-term missions teams. Now, why are we doing all of this? It's because of this message that as we have received the spirit of adoption to become sons and daughters of God, we want to now go out and share that same opportunity to other people. We're going to be going to Thailand. I'll be, I'll be serving this team and leading up this team. But we actually need your support as well. And so right now, I want to invite you guys to pray for us that you would pray for us and just pray whatever comes up on your heart, whether that's to pray a prayer over the people of Thailand where the gospel is largely unknown, to pray for the team that we would experience a filling of the Holy Spirit, an anointing of the Holy Spirit, to, to do things that are beyond what we could do naturally in our own strength. 
And whatever else God leads you to pray, would you just pray for us? Not just today, but even as you'd remember us throughout this course of time until we come back and until we share more about our trip to you. So if you do this, if you would extend your hands to the team, kind of like you did for me earlier, that you would just pray for our Thailand mission team. And whatever God places on your heart, just allow the Spirit to lead you and to lift up that prayer for us and also the people of Thailand. So let's pray together in one voice. Let's pray. Father God, we just come, God, leaning on you, leaning on the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, in our own strength, we cannot. And so, Lord, that's why we pray. Father, even right now, allow our hearts to experience your heart. That what your heart breaks for, our hearts would break for as well. What is in your heart, Lord, would you give that to us right now as we pray for the people of Thailand? us your heart, Lord. Move in this team, God, and not by power or by might, but by your spirit, God, that testimonies will come forth from this trip that will be testimonies of your faithfulness, of your power, of your goodness, Lord. No glory would go to us, but all to you, Lord. And so, Lord, we pray as a church. Father, we pray because we believe prayer works. And we believe, God, that when we pray, we see your miraculous works. God, as a church, we've seen it, Lord. The ways that you've shown up time and time again as we came to the end of ourselves, as we just depended upon you. We've seen you heal. We've seen you change circumstances. We've seen you restore relationships. And God, right now, we ask that you would move in the people of Thailand. as well as our own hearts, Lord, this short-term mission team that is about to go to Thailand. Lord, would you break our hearts for the things that break yours? Father, even as we envision these Thai people, God, most of whom have never heard the gospel message, many of whom think that to be Thai is to be Buddhist. And they have not tasted and seen your goodness. Lord, we pray over this nation that they would come to know you. Lord, that even though right now fewer than 1% are Christians, God, that we ask through the missions work that is happening there and will continue to happen there, through the prayers of the saints around the world, that this nation would come to know the love of Jesus Christ. And Father, we want to pray over this team that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. Lord, the work that you've called them to, they cannot accomplish themselves. The ministry that you call them to, they cannot accomplish themselves. And Lord, that's why you've given us this gift of prayer to lean on you, to depend on you, to ask you for strength, to ask you for love, to ask you for grace. So Lord, fill this team with your Holy Spirit that we might go and do the supernatural through your Holy Spirit 
that would lead us and guide us. Father, we pray for testimonies, not just of this Thailand trip, but the Indonesia trips, the Costa Rica trip. And God, give us stories where the praise could only be given to you. That we wouldn't say that was caused by a person. But Lord, that we could only say that happened because of the Holy Spirit and His work in that place. So Father, we thank you so much for hearing our prayers. We love you, Lord. We lift you up. And we lift up this precious team to you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can we just give it up for our Thailand mission team? Yes, sir.